Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ISBEO Safety Net webinar series. I'm Catherine Hilst. I am your uh, moderator today. I'm the ISBEO Operations Manager. And uh, before I hand this over to our presenter, Madeline, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, just note that you are on mute, and you'll stay on mute through the, the presentation. Uh, that's just for the number of people um, that are in the audience. We do, however, have a question uh, area. Usually at the bottom right of your control panel here in GoToWebinar, you can type in a question anytime. Um, so I'll look forward to that, and I'll be sending out some reminders, and we'll look at those at the uh, question and answer session after Madeline um, has gone through her presentation. Um, I'm very excited to host this series of webinars from Polaris Aero. Uh, today is the first of three, and uh, Madeline will be going over how an operator can go from seemingly nothing to a fully functioning SMS, including how safety software can benefit you, and no matter the current state of your SMS or size of your organization. Getting started is so important. Um, Madeline is the manager of customer experience and safety training at Polaris Aero LLC, and she comes with several years of experience in the business aviation sector, <clears throat> including a successful run as safety specialist, ASAP manager, and Vocus SMS administrator for a major 135 operation. She's also a recreational private pilot and is currently working on her master's in engineering of advanced safety engineering and management. Um, Madeline, I always love having you on board here, and so I am going to hand it over to you for the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Catherine, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to kick off another Springs uh, Safety Net series here with um, IBAC. So we'll go ahead and get started today. Topic being SMS, where to start for beginner and intermediate. I'm going to assume at this point that most of you, if not everyone on the call, has a general awareness of what SMS is. So today, we're not going to go down that path um, in defining it and talking about the four pillars of SMS and that sort of thing. I'll certainly be mentioning that along the way, but do you know that uh, at this point, I do assume some basic level of understanding of SMS. Today's presentation, like I said, it's not going to be training those concepts, but providing guidance for where to start when it comes to implementing or re-implementing your program, whether you call it a safety management system program or some other, um, some other term. I'm going to start first by discussing the implications of regulations and standards, since that's uh, fairly important and critical. Um, there are some interesting, I think, takeaways that you'll have from that part of the discussion. And then I'm going to provide you a different perspective on safety. We'll spend a little bit of time on this. And my hope here is to encourage you to develop your own understanding or meaning for that word. Um, there are a lot of different definitions. We can each define it differently for ourselves and for our own organizations. And I think that's a key element of safety is that it really isn't that well defined, which gives us a lot of flexibility, but it can also create a, a lot of uncertainty, right? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that. And then I'll suggest um, kind of the crux of today, three building blocks for the early stages of implementing a safety program or re-implementing a safety program in your organization. And then finally, finally I'll wrap things up with some practical next steps, some final thoughts and takeaways, and I'll also give you some resources as well that might be very helpful when you're um, embarking on this journey. As Catherine said, we do have a question and answer session at the end as well, so please feel free to put any questions in the chat box and she'll monitor those and, and we'll hopefully get to all of them um, time allowing. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into regulations and standards. Now, when it comes to implementing a safety management system, the first question we ought to ask ourselves is why? Why do we want to implement a safety management system program or a safety program or any, any form of that word or phrase? What do we need versus what do we want when it comes to implementing an SMS? And what are our motives, right? Um, that's a really interesting question. Are you implementing SMS because you are told by your accountable executive that you need to do it? Um, are you implementing SMS because you see the value in what it brings? 
Are you implementing it because that's what everyone else is doing? Or for my US operators, are you implementing one simply because you know that there is a requirement coming down the pipeline here in the next few years? A lot of different ways that we can answer that question, but understanding the why obviously is incredibly important. I um, mean, it can help us understand knowing those motives, uh, what we might need to change about our thought process in order to ensure that we're implementing something that is effective and long lasting. If this is just another check the box type of procedure, um, I hate to say it, but the likelihood that that program is going to be long lasting and effective um, isn't, isn't that great. You might be lucky and it is, you might do an excellent job with it, but again, that's something you might want to consider. And the second question we ought to ask ourselves is, which standard should we adhere to? And that is assuming that you don't have a regulation in place. If you don't have a lot of experience in this particular line of work in, in safety and aviation, um, these two questions can be a little bit daunting and they can also bring up a lot of other questions, right? Why don't all regulations inherently include SMS practices? What would an SMS provide that we don't already have? You know, we're a small organization and our safety record is great. So when and where would I see a return on investment if I were to implement a safety management system program? Those are all some really interesting questions. And they also lead us to some other questions such as, where do we even begin? Again, which standard is right for me if we don't have a mandated regulation or even if we do? What about considering OSHA or ISO or the Federal Aviation Voluntary Program or any other related operational uh, safety and health program that might exist in your own country? And what do quality and safety have to do with each other? Do I need programs for both? How do I differentiate between the two? What about maintenance? or any of my other departments, dispatch, line operations, how do they fit into this? Another important question or a common question is, do I have to be audited, right? Each of these questions in and of themselves could become their own dedicated webinars. My goal here isn't to answer all of these questions for you. Um, it's gonna take some introspection on, on your side and a little bit of research on your side as well, but I'm gonna give you some of those resources and provide some perspective on these as well. The point I'm attempting to make with um, providing you some of these questions that you might be asking yourselves is that regulations and standards inherently are going to bring up a lot of questions. And so I have some specific thoughts for you on this to help you navigate how complex regulations and standards might seem. The considerations um, you should make, I've deemed the least you need to know when it comes to regulations and standards. And the first one is it is imperative that you know the requirements as it relates to safety management of your own country's aviation authority. Now in the US, we know that safety management systems are not mandated for part 135 or 91 operations and some others as well. Really it's just part 121 airline operations that is required, that are required to have safety management systems. So that's really interesting, right? However, um, if you're flying internationally to another country that falls under ICAO's umbrella, we know that you are required to have a safety management system to some degree. We also know that in the United States, a mandate is on the horizon. So that's something else to keep in mind. However, if your country doesn't have a mandate, um, or it, I'm sorry, if it does, it is prudent to become very familiar with what those regulations are. I've got more to say about that, but we'll move on just for a moment. It's also helpful to know what programs, voluntary or recommended uh, regarding safety management exist again within your own country um, that, that's available to you readily. A lot of countries do not mandate, um, that, that don't mandate SMS either have prepared their own guidance or reference guidance from um, ICAO or their safety management manual um, edition four. Uh, another reference I'll talk about here in a little while, the US, for example, not only has a safety management system voluntary program based off of the requirements for Part 121 airlines, but they also have other guidance materials available. And all of this documentation, 
that's available to you um, is not fact, right? It's not something that you're required to follow. There's a reason we call it voluntary. There's a reason we call it guidance. However, it's still accessible to you and it gives you a good indication of things that those countries, those aviation authorities are looking for or looking at, particularly if a mandate were ever to come down the pipeline in that uh, particular country. Now, again, if you fly internationally, it's again imperative to know the requirements of the country, of the destination country you're flying to. ICAO and IBAC are useful resources here to get some of that information as far as what those requirements are. Um, if you fly just domestically, this may not be important to you. Another consideration, if your company already has a safety management manual or similar documentation, please read it. Consider who the authors were of that document. Was it some external agency? Was it someone internal to the organization? And consider the context under which that document was written. What was the environment like in that organization at that time, right? That can be very insightful, especially if we're reading a document years later and it really doesn't align with any of our processes, right? The reason for that might be because you've gone through so much change and you just haven't been able to keep up with the documentation of that. On the other hand, the documentation might be completely insightful and aligned with what you are doing and you might already have a lot of work done for you. It's just a matter of reading it, understanding it, using it, and also refining it. Okay. All too often, I do work with individuals attempting to achieve, you know, SBAO stage two or stage three status. And so often, some of these individuals don't even know what their own manual says. Uh, and I'm sure some auditors, if there were auditors on the call, would be able to, to back me up in saying that, right? I'm not suggesting that you need to know your manual by heart, but it shouldn't just be a collection of papers sitting in a binder or sitting in a folder on your your network right on your on your computer it's it should be a living document right it should be something that provides you the guidance that makes sense for your organization in addition to meeting the documentation requirements of any standard or regulation you are adhering to that document also encourages accountability for all of these practices right so if you have something in place and um, no matter how big it is please read through it um, and, and, and start to digest the information that's available in there and form an opinion about that document so that you can uh, work on that when the time comes. And then lastly, understand this fundamental concept that regulations and standards tell us what to do or what needs to be done, what we need to have in place, but not how to do it, okay? Guidance materials accomplishes um, a lot of, of that how you should do something, uh, but they're not even complete in and of themselves, right? Guidance materials that accompany a standard are typically tried and true, um, but again, guidance is not regulation itself, right? So just because, for example, the FAA has guidance available to you doesn't mean that you need to use all of that guidance um, and, and only adhere to that when you're building your program. However, again, it does give you insights into things that they do care about, and it can give you some place to start, okay? Um, another example is if you choose to comply with the International Standard for Business um, Aircraft Operators, right? Otherwise known as ISBEO, you must adhere to that standard. However, IBAC also provides a large guidance document, which includes the standard as well as an explanation of what that standard means or is intended to accomplish, right? And, and that's uh, their version of guidance, right, that they provide to you. So these are just a couple of least you need to know items when it comes to regulation and standards and guidance, right? Make sure you're familiar with these items. Uh, because what you don't want to happen is that your unfamiliarity um, leads you down the path of doing a lot of work, putting in a lot of programs and practices and, and documenting things in a certain way, all to reference guidance, documents, regulations, standards in the future, and realize that you now need to make some changes in order to comply with those, okay? 
Now, here's an interesting thing about regulations and standards is that we have been trained simply due to the nature of our business that compliance is paramount. Okay, think about that for a minute. Think about how important compliance is in our environment, specifically even in the cockpit, right? Compliance to your checklist, committing memory items, right? All of these things are, are forms of compliance. By that, I mean, <clears throat> we know that people must be in compliance with regulations and company procedures or policies companies must be in compliance with their own country's regulations and requirements and potentially international ones as well and our countries assuming they're under the um, ICAO umbrella must be in compliance with ICAO's um, standards and recommended procedures right now we know that this can this level of compliance has attributed um, greatly to the success of our industry. However, there are some issues with this mentality. It's kind of taken over, right? Again, a topic that deserves a lot more attention and discussion than I have time to give in this particular webinar. So maybe that'll be a future one down the line. But for now, I, I wanna sum up um, this comment in, in just one sentiment. Standards and regulations provide a bar that is not simply meant to be met but exceeded something else to consider here um, to, to give a little bit more context to this is that consider the audience for example for which ICAO writes its SARPs its standards and recommended procedures they there are over 190 member states or countries which are the audience of this documentation and the audience of, of their website. So consider for a moment that that's not written for the FAA or the Canadians, the Australians, the Europeans, uh, Chinese, some of these other um, first world countries that have a, a very large infrastructure. Its audience is much more vast than that, okay? And so are the capabilities of those other countries. So when ICAO is writing a lot of their documentation, um, whatever that documentation may be, the SARPs or whatever's on their website, just note that, again, it's, it's, it is a bar that has been set for everyone, but that does not mean that that's where you should draw the line personally, okay? Now, obviously, we know that the regulations and the programs that exist within each individual country also exceed typically the um, ICAO standards and recommended practices. However, um, they again set a bar that's not just meant to be met, it should also be exceeded, okay? I don't want you to um, misconstrue this message. Standards and regulations are necessary, okay? But they can also be broad and vague. They don't always fit the current climate of our organization. And there's a lot of nuance that goes into this, okay? For example, is your organization more progressive than what is required of your organization by any standard that you adhere to? Right, there, it gives you a lot, a lot of flexibility there to um, develop further than what the requirement is. Now again, point being, we shouldn't simply strive to meet the standards and regulations. We should use them as a framework to build an effective program that suits the needs of the size and likeness of our own organizations in their current and future, to the extent we can predict, climates. Is this easier said than done? Maybe, <laughs> but maybe not. There are some practical tips that I have later on that, again, can help you um, navigate this a little bit better. I suspect that our audience today, again, as I mentioned, not only has an understanding of SMS, but also has some idea of the state of safety within your own organization. Regardless of if you've had the time to actually pause and, and take an introspective look at, at not only yourself, but the organization, I can guarantee you that all of your organizations and people within those organizations are creating safety in some way right now. Okay, so that's to encourage you. If you have not begun this journey, know that you're already ahead of the game. Everyone is, right? You already have practices in place that are supporting the creation of safety in your organization. 
you just haven't defined it yet or you haven't truly observed it and identified it right that's going to take a little bit of a shift in perspective especially if you're um, someone who's coming from working the line and now you're, you're having to take a step back and look at things more systematically from a safety manager perspective it is going to take a little bit of a shift because we can be very biased based on our own past right but at the end of the day you can rest assured that you are already creating safety and so with a slight change in your perspective of what that means and how it exists in your organization you can start to identify it and then document it something i want to add in here just briefly is that even the most sophisticated operators with their robust practices and documentation likely wouldn't be able to articulate every element of safety generating pro practices or processes within their organization. And you know what? That's a very powerful thing. That's where we should strive to be, right? We should be at the point where safety exists or, or practices that we identify with safety exist everywhere. And because of how complex our organizations is, it's just undefinable, okay? Now, people often misconstru misconstrue what will happen if they choose to implement a safety program, right? It's easy to fall into that trap of believing that any such program is going to cause change and that change is bad, right? Change is scary. In all actuality, implementation of this sort of program is not designed to change what you are doing. Rather, it's meant to harness what you are already doing well and take those practices to the next level by first defining them, documenting them, and providing a way to calibrate them. That's where safety assurance is really critical as one of those pillars of SMS. So let me ask you a couple of questions, rhetorical of course. Do you observe risks before you depart on a flight? Do you have any semblance of a, a maintenance program for your aircraft? Perhaps you hold a weekly or monthly or quarterly meeting to discuss how things are going with the operation. Okay, all of these things seemingly meaningless, right? They're just part of the operation. They all fit into SMS, right? That's, that's practicing safety management right there. It's just a matter of A, documentation, and then B, leveraging those opportunities to actually incorporate things more centered around risk and human performance and some other safety critical items that you just might not be considering right now. But again, we're not changing what you're doing. We're just taking what you're doing to the next level. So hopefully you understand at this point that regulations and standards, while they're overwhelming um, or can be overwhelming, they can be broken up into digestible pieces that you still maintain discretion over how safety specific regulations and procedures are actually implemented. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ISBEO certification process at the end and maybe Catherine will be kind enough to provide her thoughts on that as well. But if you do choose to adhere to the uh, ISBEO, you'll find that the process for stage one certification is heavily tailored to exactly what I'm talking about. It's tailored to looking at the current status of your organization, refining those practices, and making you familiar with the standard, making sure that you have basic documentation in place and providing that, that kind of um, building block for reaching the next, um, the next stages of the ISBEO standard. They don't expect 100% compliance either um, or documentation or implementation of the standard from the start. So don't be overwhelmed by that. Any guidance or regulation or protocol that you use to help you get started, don't expect compliance immediately. Don't force yourself into writing all of this documentation to meet those standards, because what that's going to cause you to do is to not actually implement those in an effective way in your organization. It's not going to allow you the time to look at what you're already doing that aligns with that regulation or procedure and um, adapt it uh, via verbiage or some other processes you might need to include to meet the needs that, that you need to meet, okay? 
Before we move much further, um, in the next few slides here, I'm going to shift gears and talk about safety. And I mentioned that I would be doing that um, as well at the beginning. I've already tossed around the word quite a bit. Maybe you've caught on to that, and I'll certainly use it more in the call today. Um, but the word itself has serious implications of our perspectives and on our actions. And it also has some implications for how we can interpret regulations or our understanding of why those regulations, procedures, standards exist in the first place. So first let's recognize um, that regulations specifically, unlike standards and guidance materials, are often long overdue given the nature of how long it takes to implement a regulation or to develop it, to write it, to approve it, to administer it, to implement it, and then potentially to audit it as well, right? It takes a long time for a thought to become a regulation if it ever even does. So when we look at safety regulations, <clears throat> it's typically not only overdue, but it was also written for a certain context which may no longer accurately represent the awareness and the challenges that we face today. Okay, so consider that. Consider any safety regulation in your own um, country's authoritative um, body and consider what that regulation is actually saying or when it was actually um, recommended. Right. That that can be very interesting because we can look back in time and we can say, OK, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we were just starting to focus on human interaction with the technology function of our aircraft. Right. We got aircraft to a place where they were operating successfully. Um, we changed a lot about the aircraft itself, but accidents kept happening. So we started to look at the human interface with technology. So a lot of regulations are based off of that. Right but they, a lot of them haven't changed since. What has changed is the way that we view our organizations now, more systematically, that humans don't just interact with the aircraft, but they are a part of the system in a lot of different ways, okay? So what I'm gonna show you on this next slide is what we call um, or refer to in, in the safety world as the traditional view of safety. And this traditional view is still very much at play as an underlying concept of a lot of regulations that already exist. The traditional view, you can read there on the screen, is that essentially people are the problem. Eliminating human error via compliance will eliminate that problem. And success is measured by the number of outcomes, uh, negative outcomes that we have. Now, I know that that sounds pretty ridiculous when you say it out loud, um, and I phrased it in that way just so that you really recognize how, how quote unquote silly this really is, but I challenge you to reflect on your own experience. Have you ever judged someone's actions or the results of someone's actions because you have a preconceived idea of who they are or what their capabilities are? Have you ever been required to investigate an accident or an incident of any size um, and attributed the primary causal factor to human error, right? And if you haven't, you probably will do an investigation um, at some point, hopefully just into an incident and not an accident. Um, and you might start to catch yourself leaning towards human error as a, as a root cause, if not even a causal factor. That traditional view is obviously problematic when we state it like this, but we also know, again, that it is the root of so many regulations and standards. Remember what I was previously saying about compliance? This is where that came into play because we saw humans as fixable, right? So we're like, well, if only we can just get humans to comply with these regulations and procedures, everything will be fixed, everything will be fine. Well, we tried to do that and look where we are now. <laughs> Things are still happening and we need to look at our systems differently to understand why, right? Compliance only goes so far. 
I don't mean again to say that regulations are uh, and standards are, are bad. They're not bad. They're just incomplete, right? Or they're slightly flawed, which again is another reason why we should strive to exceed any regulation or standard as opposed to just meet the, the bar that they set. Again, as I mentioned, essentially this is what drove our adherence or our yearning for compliance. And there's this underlying sentiment that controlling people via these rules and regulations would ensure they always do the right thing, they always make the right decision, and they always stay out of trouble. The reason that that is flawed is because our systems are so complex that we cannot possibly predict every single scenario. If we could, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. We can stop at compliance, but we know that that's not working. And it's not because our, our rules and regulations aren't robust enough. It has nothing to do with that. We could add every rule and regulation that we could come up with. And at the end of the day, it still won't be enough. Okay. And the reason for that, again, is because of the complexity of our organ of our of our systems and the way that humans think and interact with those systems, the unknowability of those systems, the variability of all of the inputs in the system. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time on that topic and complexity because there's another um webinar that will be focused on that but i do want to consider a little bit more this very last point on the screen here number three and that is that success is measured by the number of negative outcomes that's uh that's really interesting right how many know how many of us can say that we have a zero incident or a zero accident record i know in my former organization that was certainly the case or how many of you have a zero incident zero accident goal in place what is that really saying about how we view safety? For one, it can cause us to not report things to keep that number at zero, right? <laughs> That's one implication, but it goes a lot deeper than that. And you'll notice a theme here that challenging and questioning our beliefs and the way things currently are is going to allow us and particularly you to critically dissect the norms in your organization and make space for that positive change within the processes and procedures and, and the culture that already exists for your organization. Okay. Now, if you say you have zero accidents or incidents, do you suspect that that's because things aren't being reported? Obviously, to a certain degree, accidents are, are knowable, right? We'll know if an aircraft is damaged or if a hangar is damaged, that sort of thing, but Incidents is a different story. Furthermore, consider that accidents and incidents aren't actually that interesting. When you investigate these events, you should be investigating them with the understanding that this singular event will never happen again in the exact same way. So even if we figure out every single condition that existed at that time, and we put protections in place so that that doesn't happen again, our environment is too dynamic, and too complex to ever allow for that exact same event to occur in the same way. Now, we can be tuned on to more systemic issues because of that accident, and that's a positive thing, right? But just using accidents to help us progress safety, it's, it's going to limit how far we go in that endeavor, okay? Think about those, those conditions like crew, weather, location, aircraft, um, any other conditions, right, that are involved in our operation of an aircraft or in our maintaining of an aircraft or in our movements or interactions with an aircraft, right, alluding to line personnel, right? All of those different factors are going to change. They're never going to appear in the same way. So the accident isn't really that interesting, right, because it's never going to happen in that same way again. However, we can learn more about what led to that accident. And that's what we, at least at Polaris Aero, call the safety story. So what is interesting is the story which leads to the accident. This gives us a lot more insight into how our organization is actually performing. And it can indicate where needs from, for improvement exist, okay? Now, <clears throat> I realize that we don't often search for a safety story if nothing goes wrong, right? So something, we have to know about something going wrong or not going the way we intended to actually look for and create the safety story. 
remember the traditional view of safety is the six is um, success is measured by the number of negative outcomes. So an increase in negative outcomes is bad, but a decrease or maintaining zero is good. What that doesn't allow us to see is, however, whether or not the incident was within our control. And it also doesn't reflect our near misses or our potential for near misses, both of which rely we rely heavily on humans to communicate to us. There are organizations um, which exist today that haven't experienced a bad outcome. And simply, that's likely because of circumstance. It's likely because of luck, right? That doesn't mean that they are incredibly safe and they'll never experience an accident again. It just means they've been able to avoid it up to this point. Doesn't mean that it'll change moving forward. And it can mean that it'll change moving forward, right? So you could do the exact same things you've been doing for 20 years and tomorrow it'll have a different outcome. Okay, and that all has to do with circumstance and how dynamic and complex our organization is. So all of this is to say that by just looking at the number of negative outcomes, we're not really looking at how safe our organization is. We're just looking at how common it is for our organization to have a bad outcome. That's really all that that's saying, right? Or it's alluding to potentially how lucky we are. It doesn't really have a true implication of how safe we are as an organization. There are some other ways that we can think about safety that'll change that. Now, the problem with this is obviously that when we're communicating with our stakeholders and management, using those things that are trackable or quantifiable, like the number of accidents and incidents we have, is an easy thing to communicate. It's an easy thing for people to understand. But herein lies another problem, right? While those numbers are good and, and business folks focus around so heavily around numbers, we need to give context to those numbers. So it's not wrong to discuss the amount of negative outcomes that you're having, but you want to give context to that, right? And you want, you want to make sure that everyone understands this isn't the whole picture. There are a lot of other things going on behind the scenes, right? Someone once said that, um, it, and it's true, I read it in a report, and I wish I had the report to reference today, that airlines that experience more incidents are technically safer because they have more opportunities for learning than airlines that don't have as many incidents. So that's something that's interesting to think about, right? All right, I'm gonna move on from this. Um, again, traditional view of safety doesn't allow us to see the big picture, even though it is a lot uh, amounts to a lot of the fundamentals of the regulations that we do have in place today. So let's look at something a little bit different and let's consider what some of the flaws are with this. And we're going to look at humans specifically, right? What we're interested about is humans because a lot of the other components of our system, um, the aircraft, the locations, uh, that we fly to, a lot of those other elements, they are knowable to, to a, a great degree. Things like weather, right, not so knowable and hard to predict, so uh, we can only discuss that so much. But humans, humans are really interesting because we are variable, we are unpredictable, but when it comes to variability, we also change the ways in which we are variable. We're constantly adapting and learning and making decisions with what we have available to us. That's a very powerful thing. So as humans, we naturally seek the path of least resistance. That satisfies both our need for, for closure, for cognitive closure, and it also satisfies our need to move away from uncertainty. As humans, we don't like to be uncertain, particularly pilots. They like known elements and, and, and maintenance technicians and line personnel, right? Everyone that's involved in our systems, we all like certainty. And so we'll take the path of least resistance that moves us more towards certainty. Note that your first reaction to this might be, well, seeking the path of least resistance is a bad thing, especially if you're no longer in compliance with the regulation. Well, sure, you need to look at compliance to a certain extent, but the path of least resistance allows us to look at our system differently 
how did that human get from point A to point B by going a different route? Was that more effective? Is that something we can leverage, right? Safety is as much about efficiency as it is making sure that people and clients go home to their loved ones at the end of the day. We also know that, again, to that point, we come to work with the intention of doing our job to the best of our ability and returning home the way we, the way we came. And in all situations, when we're confronted with a, with a situation, we generally do the best we can with what we have. Now, of course, there are certain circumstances where negligence is at play, or you might have um, alcohol at play or some other inhibitor at play. But in general, when we're faced with a situation, we do the best we can with what we have. Okay, so let's move on to a kind of an interesting visual here that I found. Has anyone ever made a decision like this? You've got a narrow path and you have one decision to make, to take the path of safety or to take the path of risk. Is it really that simple? In hindsight, sure, 100%. Oh, if only they had done this or if only they had done that. We often will add even our own counterfactual perspective into it. If only they had done this, the outcome would have been different, right? That's us projecting. We don't know that. We don't know the circumstances, all of the conditions involved. We don't know how that individual perceived that situation at that time. Were they given the opportunity to make a good decision or were all the decisions available to them ones that were going to lead to a negative outcome in some way, or they, they were unsure of what outcomes would, um, would follow, right? There's a lot that's going on in our minds when we're in a critical situation. Um, and again, hindsight, sure, safety this way, risk this way, but that's not in reality how we face problems. Realistically, this is more what it looks like. Again, we, and again, as an industry, as organizations, as individuals, as a part of these organizations, we operate within a complex system. So for those of you who haven't studied systems theory, I'll, I'll sum it up for you real briefly. A complex system is a system where the system is more than the sum of its parts. So, so what do I mean by that? I mean, you could, you could categorize every piece of the system in whatever way you choose, but at the end of the day, even if you synthesize all of that together, you put it all together, the system is going to behave in ways that are unknowable. In other words, if we were to try to break up our system into all of these pieces, okay, and put it back together, it, it would seem as though we're the same system, but it wouldn't behave in the exact ways that we predict it to, okay? Similarly, of the parts which are known, so the, the, the pieces of the system that we that we do know and we can control, we can't always know the ways in which they will interact with other pieces of the system. So sure, you might say, well, this is the way the aircraft is supposed to perform, but you add a human in the seat of that airplane and now they're interfacing it, with it, it might start to perform differently than we anticipated. Now that obviously has to do with both the sheer number of parts in our system, all of the different variables or elements that we have in our system, <clears throat> um, but the persistent variability, oh, um, sorry, I don't know why that closed there. Okay, uh, the persistent variability and unpredictability of humans and other system inputs, um, like weather, um, and things of that nature are things that we should be more cogniz cognizant of and tailoring our systems to, okay? So when it comes to making decisions, it is simply impossible to know all of the outcomes. Therefore, compliance with policies and procedures and regulations only goes so far. Those policies, procedures, and regulations allow us to respond to predictable or knowable situations, but they don't help us navigate unpredictable situations. Sometimes we even see conflicts or dilemmas arrive where a regulation conflicts with what the situation might actually require in order for us to navigate it um, effectively or safely. 
Okay, so that's where we um, can spend a little bit more, more, more time focusing on that. Even more humans, interestingly, have the capacity to adapt. Think of all of the other elements of the system, right? Weather, aircraft, locations, facilities, none of them can adapt, but we as humans can. We're not the problem, we're the solution. It's our ability to adapt that allows us to effectively navigate all of these complex situations and decisions. What's interesting is our perspective of a situation at that time that we are making a decision, okay? Because that can give us a lot of insight into the tools we have available, how an individual viewed a situation at a specific time. There's a lot of information that can come with that. So given what we know about the traditional view of safety and given what we know about humans, we need to rephrase or um, change how we measure safety. And you might be thinking, okay, isn't this getting a little bit advanced? Shouldn't I just be following the recommendations and best practices to get started? The answer is no, but also yes, right? We need to care about regulations to a certain extent, as I said, but it should just be that bar to meet, um, to, to exceed, not just to meet. If you want a successful SMS program, you must start with the fundamental understanding that people are the solution. People are adaptable, people are unique, and we can leverage people, our interactions with them, their knowledge, information sharing, sense-making of situations to navigate critical situations with a positive outcome. So where do we go from here? Well, we know that we need to exceed regulations. I've made that very clear, and hopefully you agree with me by this point. Or we at least need to have the mentality that we need not be constrained by them. And if we know that people are the solution to the challenges of complexity that our organization faces, how do we leverage that information to practically build an effective SMS? And again, keyword effective. If you're just looking to check a box and you know, write up a quick manual and say that this is your SMS, you know, that's one thing. Um, but if you want to have an effective program, these are, these are the things we need to consider, okay? So what does an effective SMS look like? Excellent question. I'm sure you're probably asking it yourself. I ask it all the time, and it's very difficult to answer. Simply put, it just depends on your organization and your people. What is the culture at your organization? An effective SMS for a small Part 91 operator who's just getting started is going to look a lot different than your larger 135s with a lot of people involved, right? Um, there's a lot of variance here. There's no singular right way to do this. All I can say is that in any case, it involves the building blocks of people, processes, and technology. So we're gonna look at those building blocks here, and this is gonna take us through to the end. All right, people, processes, and technology. So where do we begin with these three elements to create an SMS? Well, first, we need safety managers to gain their own knowledge. If you have yet to take an SMS course of any kind, consider doing so, or at least review guidance that is available to you readily. You'll want a good understanding of the big picture before you start engaging with other people. And the reason being is that safety managers are what we consider, or what I like to consider, the sense makers of the industry, right? Um, if you've watched a previous lecture of mine, I think it was last fall, um, I, I, I go a little bit more in depth in this, but you know, if someone comes to you as a safety manager and asks you a question, it's okay if you don't have the answer because they might not be asking the right question. You might need to reframe that or you might have the resources to pull on to answer that question. So consider yourself a sense maker. Consider yourself the person that should have insight into all of the different departments or areas of operation of your organization um, have a certain degree of knowledge in those areas. You don't need to be an expert in maintenance and an expert in, in, in flying and an expert in safety and an expert in line operations. It's not gonna happen. 
Okay, well, it, it might, and to those few who are that, I, I applaud you. Um, but that's not something we should strive to be either, okay? We just need to know what questions to ask, what things to consider, and who we can call on as, in terms of resources to help us make sense of questions and situations. Um, again, if you don't have the answer to the question, that, that's okay, but you should be able to reframe it or, or tap on those resources. So while you're not going to be omniscient, you know, you're not going to be all knowing, you will bring value in your ability to connect and communicate within the framework of safety practices. Okay. Next is to encourage your own people, your front lines, your pilots, your line technicians. Your, I haven't talked much about dispatchers or the people who sit at desks all day long, uh, like myself, but we're important too, right? So engaging all of us is gonna be really important, not just to get them to participate and be interested. That might not happen for a lot of people, and, and that's just the way that, that life is. However, your single, greatest source of information in your system, despite whatever data you might have available to you, is your people. Because they have interesting perspectives, right? They are the ones that are actually implementing these processes, or maybe they're not, and that's for good reason. And you just need to communicate with them to be, to be aware of that. So leveraging them, um, and, and leveraging their adaptability is going to be very useful for you. Uh, again, they're adaptable because they're full of knowledge, they're full of insight, they're full of perspectives. So, so let's harness that, okay? Now, how can you do this? Well, there are a lot of different ways. It's gonna depend on your organization. First and foremost, having a round table discussion or group dialogue is gonna be really effective and helpful for you. If that's not possible, then teleforums or conferences or one-on-one -on -one conversations can also be useful. Even surveys, to the extent that they're done correctly, can be insightful as well. The things you wanna consider, the information that you should be hoping to glean is what is and isn't working in the organization. Do people follow the, do the documentation or are they going more about their day-to-day their -day operations by tribal knowledge and memory? How do they perceive the operational effectiveness of the organization as a whole or in their own department? What concerns might they have about this impending new safety program, right? That can be a little bit daunting and, and push some people away. So it's interesting information to have. Also, how can trust be established to ensure an effective program rollout? What level of transparency do they expect from you in the, and deserve from you in, in this process. And then finally is to gain stakeholder buy-in. Now by stakeholders, I'll define that as not only upper management, but everyone in your organization, as well as the clientele that, that you interface with and, and other um, operations that you might interface with. We're all familiar with that top-down top down mentality, right? Unless you have an outstanding workforce that is incredibly effective at heavily influencing the decisions of top level management, which isn't very common, then your stakeholders need to see value in what you're trying to achieve in order for them to participate in the process. All right, next step regarding processes. First step when you're looking at your processes is to audit your processes and your documentation. You can do this a couple of different ways. You can start with a protocol or you can start with your own manual and just reading your manual and observing your people. Or you can start with some sort of gap analysis worksheet. I know there are some available on the FAA's website. I believe IVAC has some available as well. Um, if you Google gap analysis for aviation operators, I'm sure something useful might, might pop up for you. You might have another organization of similar size that uses something that, that could be useful for you as well. And, and it just takes that bit of communication to, um, to know that, okay? So what you wanna do there is look at what, what is documented, look at what your processes actually are, so actually observe what's happening in your organization, leverage your people, talk to your people to understand what those processes are and how they're navigating those processes. And then finally, look at all of that in accordance with 
any protocol regulation or gap analysis that you choose to view. And you'll start to identify gaps. You'll start to, you'll start to realize how much you are doing and probably just how little documentation you have. And, and that's one thing. You might realize you have a lot of documentation. It's just a matter of implementation. You might realize a lot of gaps in a lot of these different areas. But at the end of the day, that's going to give you a starting point for either working on your processes, writing your documentation, or a mix of both. Again, do you have your own SMS manual or some other safety documentation? Really read that, understand what it is, who it was written by, what the culture was of the organization at the time. Maybe it's effective now, maybe you need to scrap it all together. But at the end of the day, that's gonna be useful insights for you as well. Okay. Um, there are, uh, I already talked about auditing processes and documenting discrepancies. So that last point there uh, is useful not only for you, but for any auditor who might potentially um, take a look at your system. That documentation of discrepancies is going to be very interesting to them because it'll give them insights into how you view your organization as well. My pro tip for this whole process component is do not do this alone. I've made that mistake before early on in my career of trying to audit all of these different departments by myself. And again, the problem is I just don't even understand what their day-to-day -day is like. I don't know what's different from the processes versus something that they think is tribal knowledge that actually is defined, right? So leverage the people in your organization, have conversations with them, involve them in this auditing process. And if the word auditing freaks them out, don't use the word. Come up with something else. At the end of the day, you're just looking at your documentation, your actual processes, and any regulation, guidance, gap analysis that you're using to, um, to review all of those. Okay, and then the final component here is technology. Long gone are the days of paper checklists and of auditing paper manuals, right? Long gone are the days of handwritten safety reports and um, handwritten risk management processes. Maybe you still do that and that's okay, right? But at the end of the day, using technology, leveraging technology to help in these processes is going to be very important for you because this is all very overwhelming, right? Knowing the regulations, interfacing with people, documentation. Maybe you also fly the line or you're also a maintenance technician. This is a lot to take on. So leveraging technology obviously is going to be very important. Consider what technology you have available. Um, and what gaps exist. Is your technology able to suit the needs of safety promotion, safety assurance, safety risk management, and safety policy? Perhaps it is, that's excellent. Maybe it's not, consider those gaps. Okay, and then finally, I already talked about leveraging technology a little bit here, but what I really mean to say is that if your technology doesn't quite fit, then it is time to look for a different solution. This is not a ploy for you all to come look at Polaris Arrow, although we'd be glad to give you a demonstration. This is just to look at what is going to work for your organization, what is going to fit into the processes that you have already defined with minimal impact to make sure that it does gain effectiveness. If you need more information about how to transition from a current provider to a new one or start from scratch, we did a webinar last spring that does provide some more of that information about, about the transition. So go ahead and reference IVAC's website and they'll have some stuff there for you. All right. Now, I did mention that I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the ISBEO process because it does align with much of what I'm talking about today. Building an SMS program shouldn't just be something you want to do to pass an audit, right? Roots should go a lot deeper than that, especially if you want it to be successful. So if and when you do choose to register um, with ISBEO, as, as for example, um, there's a lot of information on the website of how to do so. You'll find this graphic on there. Um, what this is showing you is that they have a defined process to help you. They work with a lot of organizations that are going from nothing to something or from a little bit of something to a little bit more of something, right? Um, the first step in the ISBEO process is to achieve stage, stage one, essentially, especially when it comes to SMS. And achieving stage one, uh, they really do assist you in that process. They also have affiliates 
of which Polaris Arrow is one of them, to help support you in this process as well. People to support you in um, understanding what is needed for that stage one, um, understanding the level of documentation and the level, loose level of implementation that's required, um, and also just navigating some of the other complexities of going through an audit, that sort of thing. So again, at the end here, if Catherine has any final comments to add um, on achieving this, then, then she is more than welcome to jump in. Before we get there, I just have a few final thoughts. And this is just to recap what we've talked about today. The first thought is know your regulations, <coughs> excuse me, make use of guidance and remember that regulations and standards are not just a bar to be met. You have the flexibility to um, implement things the way that you see fit as long as you're meeting the, the specific requirement of what needs to be done. So you can determine the how, just make sure that that need is met. Recognize that you are creating safety right now. If you were to go do a gap analysis of your system right now, it's not all gonna be a gap, right? You're gonna have a lot of things in there um, that you successfully do. It's just a matter of either documenting them or implementing them. But you should know where and how you are creating safety. Okay, that's going to be a critical step in motivating you uh, through this process. Three, when an event does happen, instead of assigning blame or attributing human error as a causal factor, look at that big picture. Look at the safety story, the who, the what, the when, the where, uh, the why, and the how. It's all going to be very informative for you. Remember that safety is not just about preventing a bad thing from happening and that people aren't to blame. People are the solution. The system we create, the tools that we give people to do their jobs and the uncontrollable nature of our work environments all account for negative outcomes, not just people. So rather than focusing on prevention, we should shift towards learning, towards information sharing, towards making sense of these situation and gathering that knowledge and, and making sure we maintain that knowledge over time at appropriate times. And then finally, leveraging your people, your processes and your technology. Remember that complex systems require complex solutions. So it's not gonna be easy. You're already doing a lot of it. There are some basic steps that you can take to get started. There are people that you can reference and utilize to help you, such as program support affiliates of IBAC um, and your own network. You're not gonna build the program in a week or in a month or potentially even in a year. It's gonna take time and diligence, but you will get there. And there's a lot of guidance, people out there who are willing to help, right? Safety shouldn't ma uh, be maintained in our own little bubbles. Uh, it should be free flowing. So I've got a couple of final resources here, um, names of documents or things for you to reference that can be very helpful getting started. Um, also note that your current providers, if you have any, may also have things that uh, they can provide you for support. So for example, Polaris Arrow, that is essentially my job. <laughs> my job is to help you navigate our program uh, within the context of your own organization. Okay, um, and a lot of organizations do have um, similar similar folks like this. I can't speak to the SMS providers, but I know some other ones do uh, do as well. Leverage your own network. People of your own shape and size have gone through this before, so take a look at what they did. Have that conversation. Utilize your providers to maybe make those connections for you. At Polaris, we're happy to connect you with some of our more key clients um, that have been able to take something and um, nothing and turn it into something, okay? Um, I've got some IKEA references up there, NBAA for the domestic US users. That's a great reference. They have a lot of links to a lot of different sources on there that they can provide you in, in one place. And then I also wanted to mention at the very bottom is the Business Aviation Safety Summit hosted by Flight Safety Foundation. Polaris Arrow will be there. If you have the opportunity to still register, that's a great opportunity for you. Um, to just to get a little bit more involved in kind of the safety talk and safety knowledge aspect of this industry. So with that said, um, I think we're just up on time. We do have a couple of webinars coming up in April and May. I've listed them on the screen there. And if we have time, Catherine, we can take a couple of questions. 
Sure. Thanks again so much, Madeline. It's uh, and and also for um, outlining the ISBEO process, which is one of the um, well, obviously our standard, but um, it recognizes just what you've been saying that this process takes time, um, and that for for our standard is reflected in the registration stages. And I think that's really the the key for everyone, um, especially starting out, is just knowing that this um, takes time and that you are already working on it. Um, so thank you for that. We do have a couple of questions. And in this, um, one of them is, do you have any advice about how to motivate leadership to take the time with frontline people and understand their perspective on their work and safety related issues? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, and maybe Steve has some comments on this as well from his experience working with leadership because I, I more work with the front lines, but I see this happen um, all the time. So one thing that I can say is, um, work on their perspective of what safety means, kind of like how I did it with you all, you all today, right? Um, safety is it's it's not its own thing, right? It is actually a business practice. Um, there is value in safety uh, for leadership, and that value comes in the form of efficiency. It comes in the form of return on investment of um, less you know, less maintenance time for the aircraft, less need for um, sending people back to training if they've already gone and, and maybe they weren't successful the first time around. There are a lot of different ways that you can see ROI. Um, and without having that data to work with from the get-go, it can be difficult to communicate exactly what the ROI will be for the organization. But at the end of the day, you can still rely on that concept that Safety is a business practice. Safety does create efficiencies. And hopefully that gets them motivated a little bit more to think about it a little bit differently. Um, and then when it comes to them directly working with the front lines, again, every organization is going to be different in how they do this. Um, the, the first and most fundamental thing that you can do is just get them in a room together. Just get people talking, even if it's just leadership sitting and observing um, a meeting, but hopefully there's there's a little bit more interaction. That's those are the two recommendations I have. So changing the framework of the mindset of leadership, and then also just practically incorporating them, not by their own choice, right? I don't want to say make them do it, but set up <laughs> opportunities for them to leverage, um, and then hopefully that becomes more second nature to them, something they want to be a part of, and then you can facilitate that in different ways. Right, just start changing changing the fabric of how things are done. That's great. Thanks, Madeline. Um, when you said, don't go about this alone and work with your people, um, can you share your thoughts on what you think about using a consultant to assist or ways of networking? You kind of touched on that with other flight departments who might have experience that they're willing to share. Yeah, absolutely. Consultancies are excellent and so are communicating with the network that you have available to you or a network that you might not even realize is available. I mentioned right at Polaris, we, we have many clients of various different sizes and um, extremely successful ones at that who are outwardly willing to communicate with you to walk you through what their process was. Um, so by just asking the questions, just opening up the door for that information to flow is going to be very important. Yeah, consultancies are are amazing. We partner with one, um, Billy Bartholomew, who's, who's done a couple of these webinars in the past, is excellent, him and his team will actually come on site and, and work with you um, right then and there. So the only thing that you'll want to do or make sure that that you've done in advance of bringing a consultancy on is um, understand to the best of your ability where your organization is at now and have some idea of where you want to be and how you want to get there are you interested in going through an audit and potentially why um, just having some of these thoughts formulated before they come is going to help them give in get insights into what it is that you're trying to achieve and tailor their um, their work with you. Um, there are consultancies too who will come in and do a, do a complete gap analysis for you as well. Um, all of that's great. At the end of the day though, they aren't the ones who are in the day to day of your operations. It's like an auditor coming into your office and spending two, three days with you. That's a good amount of time and they're looking at a lot of information. However, 
they don't see the true inner workings of your organization and the culture and the things that might have been swept under the rug. So just just know that and take everything with a grain of salt. But yes, I do recommend if you have the financial ability to hire on a consultant to do so. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, also, uh, there are some insurance providers, if you check with your insurance, they may uh, have some information um, to help you get started. Um, so it's definitely worth asking your, your brokers about that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And I, where did it go? There it is. Um, I, when, um, so, uh, let's see. Um, so some of the challenges, you, you mentioned that you were in a safety manager role and just um, to maybe share a little bit of your experience with that um, since folks are looking at getting started, um, how do you sort of step into that? This is a big question to end with, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Just maybe some, some uh, you know, best two practices for getting started in a role as a safety manager. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from my experience moving into the safety role at that former organization of mine, I had identified that um, there were a lot of good things happening in the organization, none of which were documented. So when I I went through my first audit within three months of, of uh, arriving at the organization and they were like, well, your documentation is great and your processes are great, but they don't match. <laughs> there's, oh. this, there's this disconnect. And you know, at the time, that was a that was seemingly okay. There wasn't a lot of turnover in the organization, and things were going well. So you know, we're like, okay, well, we'll we'll modify things and keep up to date with the documentation. But where that became really important is when turnover happened, a, a good amount of it as well, because what we were training wasn't match in our documents wasn't matching up with what was actually being done, and it was creating a lot of confusion in the organization, particularly by those new hires. And those new hires are some of the most valuable people that you will have because they have zero idea of what's going on in the organization. They're seeing everything with fresh eyes. And that that perspective is very, very useful for you, right? Um, so, and, and that's how we, we kind of came to understand that, okay, we need to align these things a bit better because this is actually having a negative effect on what's going on and previously that that wasn't the case i know right now there's a lot of turnover happening in the industry a lot of folks being sucked up the airlines and just a lot of turnover in general um, and so that's something that you're definitely going to want to consider um, the other thing to consider too is that i was I, I was always at my desk working on things best i could i was trying to get out into the field and to, and to complete my audits because i had to do that but what i wasn't doing was just walking around and talking to people. Um, and, and that organic um, nature of, of the business is gonna be also very insightful for you. Um, obviously the problem is if you have kind of this safety name or safety title, safety vest, whatever, people can start to have a little bit of, a, of an impression of what it is that you're doing there. They might be a little bit nervous around you. That's what it's thinks. So that might be a challenge that you need to navigate. Um, at my former organization, I was coming from a kind of a entry level role. I was very well liked at the time into a safety role and people's perceptions of me started to change a little bit, which was interesting just because of the new role that I was in. So um, that just shows you the stigma that existed at the time around the safety roles. That might be a challenge um, for you, but you can also uh, use other, other people to help um, do those observations for you as well and, and kind of report back if that's something you need to navigate. Great advice, Madeline. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are up to our time here today, so we'll wrap it up with that one. Uh, those are some great thoughts to, to leave with as well. And uh, this will be available on a, um, a recorded on the IBAC website for everyone. I also put a link into the next uh, Safety Net, which is on April 21st, talking about flight risk management. And uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here today. and um, we will hopefully see you at a few more of these safety net webinars. We've got a lot of exciting uh, things coming along in Polaris, Arrow, Madeline. Thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure and um, the, the presentations and the material are just so useful. So I hope everyone has something to take home with them today and we will see you on the next safety net. Have a good day. Bye-bye.